Good afternoon and welcome to Insala's webinar on Common Core State Standards and English Learners. Our presenters today are Joanne Urrutia from the United States Department of Education, Office of English Language Acquisition. Also joining us today is Judy Elliott, a former Chief Academic Officer with Los Angeles Unified School District, Lily Wong Fillmore from the University of California at Berkeley, and Margarita Calderon, a Professor Emerita from John Hopkins University. We'll be taking questions at the end of the webinar today. If you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat box at any time. Um, unfortunately, as we have a large number of participants on today's webinar, I'm afraid we aren't going to get to everybody's questions today, but we will answer as many as we can. The event will be recorded and will be available on Ancela's webinar if you would like to share it with your colleagues. We have had a lot of interest in this webinar and unfortunately haven't been able to accommodate everybody at the live event today. We'll disseminate the information about the archive recording through the Ancela list. I'd now like to introduce Joanne Urrutia from the Office of English Language Acquisition at the United States Department of Education. Uh, good morning uh, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the uh, nation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today to introduce this topic um, that we are all very interested in as we move uh, forward in the reform initiative. Um, what I um, anticipate doing is just putting um, some of the um, uh, reform initiative context on the issue of why we are um, all trying to figure out the best way of transitioning uh, to common core standards and how English learners can benefit from this uh, process. So um, for those of you that um, may not be aware, um, the department has been uh, very involved in the last few years on um, working with states so that we can move the um, reform agenda either through the Race to the Top competition or through the ESEA flexibility uh, package. Um, and I wanted to share with the field um, the basic principles that are generating our efforts. As you can see from the um, slide in front of you, um, the ESEA flexibility address four major principles. I want to address the first three. Um, the last one has to do with um, you know, monitoring and, and reporting and so on. So we won't uh, address that here today. But the other three are interrelated and key to improving uh, student outcomes. Principle number one is related to transitioning to college and career readiness. Um, we have heard many times that our students are not ready for college or for the uh, business and career world. So um, the states have uh, stepped up to the plate and have been um, revising their own um, content standards or adopting the common core standards so that they um, uh, ascertain that students, when they graduate from uh, high school will be ready for college or career without any need of remediation. You are all very aware that the um, college and career stand standards and in particular the common core standards that have been adopted um, ha um, require uh, much rigor and uh, a different approach to uh, instruction. So all of these uh, states and districts are in the process of transitioning and implementing uh, the new standards. The issue in terms of um, 
ELs is that in order to prepare English learners um, to meet these rigorous standards, we also need to take a look at the English language proficiency standards so that we make sure that when we say that students are proficient, that they are ready for the uh, academic language that is required to meet the um, Common Core standards. You see a timeline on that slide that gives you a general uh, idea of um, the, how states are working and more or less when the uh, new assessments um, aligned to the new standards will be implemented. Principle number two is related to the um, accountability systems for Title I. Um, the flexibility is uh, allowing states to move away from the, um, the previously uh, AYP requirements, and now it is allowing each state to come up with different systems of accountability as to how they identify the schools, uh, the lowest performing schools that need uh, to concentrate their efforts for reform in those schools. Um, this is relevant to ELs because many of the schools that are being identified uh, are schools that contain large numbers of English learners or schools in which the achievement gap between the uh, English learners and the all student group is not narrowing. The last principle that I want to um, share with you is uh, principle three, which has to do with supporting an effective instruction and leadership. In this uh, area, the states that were granted flexibility um, committed to developing systems of evaluation for both teachers and principals that include, as one of, of many measures, uh, student outcomes and student growth. But that's not the important part of the system, although it is very important. Uh, the important part is, is not only the evaluation system, but what support systems are going to be in place to make sure that uh, both the leadership and the teachers uh, are effective teachers, and in particular with ELs in our case. So professional development then becomes very important as part of these new systems that are being developed uh, in the various states. And again, you see there your uh, projected timeline for the implementation. Um, so here you have the current status of those states that have um, requested flexibility and uh, the ones that are um, in red are those states that also had raised to the top grants. So as you can see, you have uh, 34 states and the District of Columbia who have uh, been awarded uh, flexibility. You have uh, several states that are in the process of being approved and some that um, either have not applied or withdraw, they withdrew their application. But um, so there's a very large portion of the states that will be um, uh, committing their work to um, college and career ready standards, to new systems of accountability, and to um, new systems of um, determining effective instruction and effective teachers. Uh, so this is the context that then brings us to um, the essential questions. The work ahead for all of us is how do we transition to these more rigorous standards. And in particular, for us in the field of English learner education, how do we prepare teachers, and I say all teachers, not just the special teachers, to make sure that they have the techniques, the strategies to support English learning learners in meeting the uh, college and career ready standards. Um, so as you can see, the work of the um, experts that are going to be talking to you later today are, is very important. And um, the key to the success of 
this reform initiative is making sure that um, we provide the support, the resources, so that teachers can uh, have the tools to assist English learners in meeting these new standards. So that said, I'm going to uh, now um, transition to the first presenter, Judy Elliott. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanne. Good afternoon and good morning to all of you. Um, in my section with you today, I am going to give you um, kind of a frame of the multi-tiered system of support um, in which Common Core standards and universal design can be looked for, looked at for all students, including our English learners. This um, portion is really based on, and I'll talk about it in, in a few minutes, on a white paper that was recently recently uh, written for the Council of Great City Schools, wherein um, the paper, con you know, concentrated and sewed a tapestry together of how Common Core standards and the multi-tiered system of support, um, which is also referred to in many places as response to instruction or RTI as well as the universal design for learning can be used as a framework as we move our work to move forward in our work uh, around common core standards so just as a as a, a basic uh, premise for all of us on the call today it's um, and I think Joanne framed it very well that this is really Although we're, we're talking about English learners and common core standards, the purpose of having a multi-tiered system of support is so that every student, regarded, regardless of ethnicity and background and language proficiency and special needs, really are a part of a system. So the vision for this um, is really that we want all of our students at or above proficiency and that they have what they need, both social and emotionally, to actually engage in learning. Um, and when we talk about an integrated system, um, of educational services for every ed. It's really about every education. It's Title I education, gifted education, special education, you know, anything that has to do with education that when we're talking about putting our services together for students, uh, especially around the Common Core, that every ed is at the table as we talk about how do we integrate and move away from more of a siloed approach that we currently have going on. And then, of course, looking at support services for students. Um, and the outcome of this work, um, as you can see, and again, a national movement um, across the country with working with the multi-tiered system of support, it's really about good first teaching. This is not about, you know, putting students into different programs or different, you know, service areas. It's really about first taking a look at how are we addressing um, the language proficiency needs of our students, the special needs of our students, to make sure that the very best good first teaching is, is happening for students. And you can see that this is not just about students at risk, it's those students that are highly able. So how do we ensure that students are getting um, instruction and intervention at both ends of the spectrum? And then I guess the, the, the fourth bullet there that I would highlight is really looking at the over and under representation, over representation of students um, of diverse needs in areas such as special education needs, um, and, and suspensions, you know, all of those, those types of things. So it's really about not just academics, but it's academics and behavior. And the one I would also highlight on this slide is really looking at the return on investment. And I would really encourage all of us um, on this call today to really talk and listen about, as you, as you think about what you have going on in your districts, of all of the work that you're doing with your students, how do you know and how do you ensure that you're getting a return on the investment, meaning that if you are doing some specific interventions and specific instruction for certain students, how do you know it's working? And that is where the database decision making comes in in this specific model. So if you look at this slide, this is really about using an evidence-based model really driven by database decision making and problem solving. Um, the nice thing about this is there is no one way, right way to do this work. It's really about using the data that you have and ensuring that we're being responsive to the needs and intensities of students. And it's very need driven. And I think as Joanne highlighted in the opening of this webinar is that the professional development that is needed for all, stu all teachers around ensuring that they have the skill set and the tool set to work with English learners as well as all learners, is really what should be driving our work around professional development. Because the goal is to accelerate the performance of students. So 
it's really some, you know, some folks say, well, we've got, you know, positive behavior supports and we've got RTI. Really, uh, this, this uh, slide is really to highlight this is a multi-tiered system of support, which is the umbrella under which academics and behavior and technology fall, so that it's really the umbrella that highlights the work here. Really quickly, this is what this, this is about. You take your students and your population, you put them into intensity and different needs uh, tiers of support in order for them to, to meet benchmark. And the goal of this, this model, as you know, or this framework is really about students being successful regardless of what tier they are, not about labeling kids. And it's all premised on the problem-solving approach, which is, as you see, it's, you know, defining the problem and then analyzing why we think it exists and then implementing a plan. We are very proficient in education when about defining a plan, a problem, and then moving right into a plan. Um, what I would encourage everybody to remember is that the, one of the most critical aspects of the problem-solving process in this work is really analyzing why the problem exists. So, for example, um, if students are not meeting reading uh, benchmarks, they're not doing well um, on their reading, is it because of the reading program? Is it because of the pedagogy and how it's being delivered? Or is it perhaps they're not attending school on a regular basis? So how you analyze each one of those things will guide how you implement a plan. If a student is not reading it at proficiency because they're not attending schools, you would devise a plan very differently from a student um, who is not meeting reading proficiency because of pedagogy being delivered. Two different ways to do a plan. So when we def define the problem, it's critical that we hover over the problem analysis to ensure that we implement a plan. Um, and then after the plan is implemented, of course, evaluate it to see if we had response to instruction and intervention. So what does this look like in schools? So a characteristic of a school that is doing a multi-tiered system of support, and you can see this, the, the, the second one is, is highlighted because this is not about early intervention, folks. This is really about prevention. How do we collect data in critical areas for our students to ensure that we prevent a gap from happening? We know that our students that are coming in um, with language um, proficiency needs need a lot of, of intervention and early identification. However, how do we ensure that the interventions that are and the programs and services that are being delivered for our learners are frequently um, modified and evaluated so that we're really looking at um, the rigor and relevance of what they're getting on a regular basis? A district that is um, doing the multi-tiered system of support really is looking at an outcome of improved academic and behavior performance for all students regardless of setting, which means that it's, it's an every ed issue. It's your gifted, it's your special ed, it's your English learners, that everybody is improving their rate of progress and performance. There is a significant reduction in proportion, disproportionality across multiple measures, and then of course a reduction in special education. So this is really not about a new initiative. I know some folks, depending on what, where you are in a district or a state, people are saying, wow, there's one more thing for us to put on our plates, when in fact this is really about integrating what we know works for students in terms of instruction. So it is really having us think about a shift in our thinking that instead of putting the students under the microscope and saying, well, we have English learners that have these needs or we have these students that have these needs, what's wrong with the student that's causing a performance discrepancy? It's rather about shifting to what is the interaction of how we teach and what we teach and the learning environment for students. What, what in that has to be altered in, in, in order to have our students learn at higher levels? So it's really shifting the thinking in terms of from the student to really the interaction of what's going on in our classroom and our instructional delivery. So to highlight in this area, it's really a frame, not a box. What you're not going to hear is any specific thing around a program, an approach. This is really, in my, my section here, is really about elevating that this really is a framework within, within, within which anything that you're doing for your English learners, for other students that you are working with really fall. And it's the parts of the framework as such as you see here. There's three services of delivery. 
in which everything around academics and behavior fall. The content within these tiers is not driven by this. It's really about using the data to decide what's working for students. As a part of this, of this framework, there's the use and regular review of data to ensure that we are fluid and responsive to students who are, are struggling and who are doing well, um, and making sure that we're using data to make the decisions around that. Critical that the interventions and instructions are modified. None of this is meant to be a life sentence for students. You're not in a, in a getting tier three services. You're not getting, you know, service and support as a tier two. The fluidity of students um, in terms of the intervention and instruction delivered is a critical aspect of this work. And that, irrespective of where students are getting uh, supports, that it is integrated across. Um, we know right now, for example, when we created our special education programs, that we thought that if we put students in separate settings and we slowed down the progress, the, the instruction a little bit, that we would be able to better instruct our students in those areas. And what happened, as we know, is that our students in special education, in some cases, have fallen farther behind, have been given separate programs and materials, and so it's very difficult to get them back into the standards-based instruction in the mainstream. The same thing for our English learners. It's critical that whatever we do, that we are practicing and integrating whatever um, intervention and instruction on our Common Core standards, on our standards that all students should know and be able to do, so that we don't have a siloed approach to this um, instruction. And again, here is um, this is a moving slide, but it's 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 kind of set the way it is here. So basically, to look at is that you know what we want for our students is that we want at least 80% or more of our students um, doing well in our core instruction of the students receiving the core instruction, 80% of them performing well. And then layered on top of that is the supplemental, where students, in addition to what they get in core instruction, they will get um, additional um, interventions, and in, in many cases, it's pre-teach, preview, review, front loading of academic vocabulary, those things that we know that students need in order to do well. And in Tier 3, approximately 5% of our, our students um, receiving something perhaps very different than what other folks, other students are getting in core instruction because of the fact that their needs are so incredibly um, intense. So that, that kind of highlights what um, the overall model looks like. And then, you know, um, really looking at this in terms of our shifting in our thinking, um, I think right now, you know, a lot of us um, are focused on procedural concerns and, and rather than instructional focus. This is really about what do students need and how do we make that happen. Um, how are our L1 and L2 language proficiencies being monitored on a regular basis in our Tier 1 or core instruction? Um, how do we instructionally target um, in our core instruction to ensure that our students at different levels of English proficiency are being met? So it's really moving. Um, less from from procedural concerns to more what do our students need and how do we make that happen. And you can see it's shifting to more systemic problem solving and really hovering over that problem analysis to ensure that we are on the right mark for this. Um, really looking at blended expertise, one of the things that raised concerns for me and the work that we're doing around um, Common Core and the, and, the, and the things going on nationally is that we, we really have to focus on making sure that general education teachers do have the skill sets and the professional development and the opportunity to learn the tools and the strategies they need to ensure that all of their students, including students of, with English language needs and special education needs, are able to teach the Common Core. And I know that both Lily and Margarita will talk more about that. Um, and really looking at instructionally relevant assessment, you know, and then finally looking at the whole child, regardless of educational needs, um, that we are we're so quick to label students versus saying what is it that students need in order to be successful in their environments. So this is a highlight of what the change model looks like. It's really built upon you know, three kind of what I call buckets of work, consensus, infrastructure, implementation. Um, we may have consensus that our students are not at where they need to be. 
but do we have the infrastructure to actually implement what we think students need in order to move forward? So critical to this aspect is really looking at um, what are the problem solving processes that you're using? What are the database decision making processes? And how are we, how do we monitor and, and really look at academic engaged time? Um, in a classroom of high school uh, algebra and geometry um, in the last couple weeks um, with lots of English learners, um, teacher was doing a phenomenal job teaching. However, there was very little academic engaged time, checking for understanding, having students turn to a, uh, an elbow partner. So while there was, there was um, teaching going on, it was of question as to whether or not at what level of understanding or comprehension the students really had around the work that was being done. So really the academic engaged time, which we know is the number one predictor of how well students are going to do, um, is really a critical aspect of this, this framework. So just to summarize, you know, kind of we, we did this work in Los Angeles um, uh, when I was there as the chief academic officer. And, you know, people say, wow, this is, it's, it's a big district. There's so, so many things. We can't do it. So I just wanted to highlight that, again, you know, when you take this on, this multi-tiered system of support, when you take it on as a systems approach to using data to drive instructional decision making for all students, including English learners, including special ed, including gifted ed, you tend to see improvement. So I, what I wanted to do is just share with you just a really big highlight um, of 2010, 11, and 12. And so we showed a lot of growth in all the areas. And I would just highlight for you um, the third bullet, 19-point um, growth in, in um, district-wide points in 2010. Um, the statewide growth was 10 points, LAUSD made 19 points, 16 points in 2012. So what we're doing, and it's not, it's not one specific thing you can point to, but it's really building a culture of database decision making. And if you look as you go down, um, I gave you in, in 2011 we had a 15 point increase for our African American students, a 21 increase. 21 point increase in 2010 and a 17 point increase in 2012. And this is on the Academic Performance Index, which is the index that California uses to um, rank schools and to show growth. You can see students with disabilities a part of this multi-tiered system of support, meaning that students' intensity across tier 1, 2, and 3 are looked at irrespective of whether you're special ed, your general ed, your English learner, your needs. And you can see you know, that last year in 2012 in red, there was a 26 point growth. In 2010, there was a 20 point growth. And then the blue part, um, 28 point growth in 2011. So between 2011, 2010, and 2012, that's a lot of points. That's almost 60, what is that? You can add it up. There's a lot of growth. And then if you look at the last one, English language learners, um, in 2011, which is the blue, we had a 20 point jump for our English learners. In 2010, we had 11 point. And then this last year in 2012, a 13 point. And again, really focusing on what are we doing in our classrooms, what is the data saying that our students need, and really ensuring that professional development is delivered to students um, to ensure that we are being reflective and fluid on our delivery of instruction for students. So I'm going to direct you to at at uh, your leisure to really look at this paper, and I think it's, it was uploaded onto the website. Um, Common Core State Standards um, using the multi-tiered system of support. The purpose of this was really put together to kind of sew the tapestry for students um, and, and people around multi-tiered universal design for learning as well as um, the Common Core. So you can see that it outlines the key components of the multi-tiered system of support. It really it talks about how Common Core standards can be implemented in the broadest perspective, and then um, how we can better deliver that instruction to students. 
it really in this is, is the multi-tiered system of support is the how we do it, the common core standards is the what. So the common core standards is the what we need to deliver and the multi-tiered system as I just kind of went through really talks about how a multi-tiered system of support where you look at core in tier one, supplemental in tier two, and then our intensive needs for tier three. How can we use that in order to best provide services for our students? So and I think what it, it, it speaks to is irrespective is how, with what fidelity and robust um, instructional delivery of the Common Core Standards, you're still going to have some students who are going to need pre-teach, preview, review, front load, all of the work that we know, especially given the intensive um, use of evidence-based text in our Common Core Standards with our English learners, there's going to be a continued need to ensure that we do have a structure of support for our students. So this is this slide highlights the kind of ten areas that were really um, highlighted in the white paper, and you can see the critical nature of um, the components. It's really critical that we look at our aligned policies and practices, and and I say that because in some cases, some of the policies and practices that we have in our districts, while um, well intentioned sometimes are the exact policies that get in the way of allowing schools and districts to have flexibility in how they deliver services. So really important to know that you know, the policies and practices that are in your schools and, and districts are aligned with database decision making and it's really about not a specific program or not a specific um, way of doing things but you're being reflective of the data and the needs of professional development. And you can see, um, I would say, I would highlight number five as being critical. Database decisions, it's real easy to say that we're a database decision making culture. However, we really need to make sure that people really understand and can use data to progress monitor and make changes in instruction for students. And then number seven, really looking at what are we delivering right now? What's that return on investment that we're getting in our kids? So for English learners, what what programs, what, what methods of instruction are being delivered and are we seeing the return on investment in terms of re improved student achievement? And if we're not, then it, then it really behooves us as professionals that we say, okay, so how do we problem solve and what are the nature and the needs of our students relative to what we're doing right now? So it's a fluid use of instruction and methodologies to make a difference for students. And then, of course, the critical aspect of including um, and engaging parents, guardians, and caregivers of our students so that they, too, can be very much a part of helping um, move our students' achievement. So I would say that the Big Bang Theory of Common Core State Standards and Multi-Tiered System of Support is really as simple as this, folks. Decide what we know is important for students to know. Teach them what's important for them to know. Keep track of how students are showing what they do, know, and make changes according to the results. So it's, it's not anything new. It's really just putting a, um, a framework together for how we work for, for kids. So the next couple slides really just highlight um, what Common Core standards do and do not provide. And, and most of you all know this, and this is just a, a very high level um, review, that the Common Core standards don't provide a complete scope and sequence for how to teach and what to teach students. Um, the essential skills and knowledge students could have. They don't provide what most of us have seen in, in some of our past uh, standards documents. What they do provide below is the most essential skills and knowledge of every student that every student needs to master to be successful in college and career. Now I'm going to be very high level here because I know that um, the next two, two speakers are going to be very in depth in this area. But I wanted to just highlight that we know that we've got our anchor standards for K-12. And you can see that you've got reading, writing, listening, speaking, and language. And you can see that the anchor standards per strand, you've got 10 for reading and writing and 6 for the listening and speaking and language. So for lingu English language arts in terms, and again, a lot of this is highlighted in, in much more depth and complexity in the white paper that we did. Um, but 
we know that there's the shifts um, in our current practice right now, and I and I know that we're all highly aware of this for our English learners. The, the absolute essential um, building background knowledge is through rich informational texts. In addition to the literary text, is is a very important thing for our English learners and really critical um, in terms of the skills that they're going to be asked and are, are going to be required to do in as we shift to our common core state standards. The reading, writing, and speaking, again, evidenced from text and um, which will continue to be a challenge for our English language learners and the, the, the practice with uh, com complex text and academic language. I'm not saying anything to this, this group of uh, folks that you don't already know. The critical aspect of the shift in how we approach our instruction for English learners is the purpose of this webinar, and I know Lily and Margarita will go into detail around that. The purpose of a multi-tiered system of support is knowing what we know about the shifts and the heavy load on um, informational text for English learners is a way for us to really look at how instruction is being delivered and, in, in essence, tier our support. Core instruction, what should folks be getting? What is the, the tier two services, if you will, for students who are not, based on data, not making the progress that they need to? What are those additional scoops, if, as I call them, additional scoops of instruction that we need to focus on for our students um, to, in order to shore up skills? And then tier three, of course, being what are those skills for our, our English learners um, new to the country, needing lots of support and language. What do we need to have for them in order to allow them to be successful in our common core? So again, just to highlight, this is you know literacy and numeracy across content areas. Um, always like to show that the, the the standard is listed at the top of the page. Read closely to determine. That's the anchor standard, if you will, and this is an example of what that standard looks like for kindergartners and what that standard, that same standard, looks like for 11th and 12th grade. And so the example is just to highlight that it really is literacy and numeracy across, in this case, literacy across all areas, K through 12. And then here is an example, again, um, text explicit. Um, for history, social studies, reading, anchor standard, same as English language arts. Here's what it looks like for history, social, social studies in grades 6 through 8, and then how it is extrapolated into grades 11 and 12. And so just to highlight that that is how this spans the grade levels. So finally, in concluding this section in terms of the white paper, it really, um, as we move toward continuing the shifts and the movement toward our common core standards uh, within the framework of MTSS, really ensuring that we look at our alignment and our realignment of how we deliver our services right now to students, how are we delivering the best tailored professional development we need to develop to deliver to all students to ensure that they have what they need to teach our English learners. How do we have ongoing training set up to ensure that we can not just deliver it once, but we can build the capacity and ensure the maintenance of that work? And then we didn't talk a whole lot about, but incorporating um, universal design for learning principles, which is really about um, looking at those um, unintentional barriers that are set up for students as we deliver instruction. And so universal design for learning are critical aspects to what, what students learn, how they learn, and why they learn it. Um, and then again, providing for family and caregivers, how do we ensure that they are a part of the learning process and can support at home, and then really communicating very clearly about an accountability system with expectations, that this really is about all students, high expectations, and that everything that we do based on data over multiple measures is aligned to ensure that students get exactly what they need in order to be successful in our Common Core standards. So with that, I'm going to complete my section, and I am going to hand this over to Dr. Lily Wong, Fillmore.
Hey, thank you, Judy. And uh, hello, everyone from California. Um, I'm pleased to be here and to hear uh, what Judy had to say. I, I just think this is such an important um, uh, change in how we look at what the children can do, um, and especially looking at English learners not as a separate class of learners, but rather as a part of the total student body of our schools uh, with uh, some need for help in dealing with the language. So um, I know a lot of people have been very worried about um, the, um, the common core with respect to English learners. I am not. I think that this is a chance finally for them to learn what they have got to learn in order to deal with the uh, adult needs um, and, the, and to be prepared to go to college and, and for work later on. But I just wanted to start with a vignette to remind us all what this is all about. And this really happened just uh, last week, in fact. I was working with a young man on the eve of his first semester at the local community college. Now, he, this, this young man started school in kindergarten as a non-English speaker. By the time he was in the second grade, it was determined there was something wrong with him. Uh, he was not uh, learning to read well enough, fast enough. Uh, and uh, so it was determined by the school district that he had a learning disability, whereupon he was placed into special ed. After that, um, he was pulled out from his regular, the regular time, the two and a half hours in the state of California devoted to reading instruction um, and placed with a resource teacher who worked with him on uh, decoding. Um, now he, uh, this has gone on through high school. And so I was working with him because he is a smart young man, so eager, just totally committed to doing whatever is required to get a college education, but so poorly prepared for the rigors and demands of college level work. He could not, he could read well enough if uh, decoding is reading. He could not make much sense of what he was looking at, reading, and so on, or follow the text. And the question that um, I'm going to raise is why not? Why a smart young man who really wanted to succeed in school, why didn't, why wasn't he better prepared? So that's what my remarks are all about. And I'm going to be talking about what must be changed to give kids like this young man a fighting chance in college and in the workplace. So the big questions I want to raise are these. What has prevented so many English learners from getting an education in our school? Too often, the blame is placed on the kids themselves, their families, or on their circumstances. They, they are thought to lack motivation to learn. They lack family support. And by the way, in the case of this young man, and then with many, 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 many others, there is no lack of family support. There is none. The families want the kids to succeed. They, they send them to school. They, they believe that the school will deal with the problems or that the kids are experiencing. And of course, a great, great deal of blame is placed on the lack of English, uh, on poverty, and so forth. If you want to know what I think the truth is, I will say the problem is us. And the many, many barriers, Judy spoke of barriers, the many barriers we have thrown in the way of their academic progress, not in malice, sadly, but in our eagerness to help. Now, you all know why the Common Core standards were needed. 
They provide a necessary course correction for the U.S. public education system, which unfortunately, because it is not doing well by many students, is really losing public support. And there has been, over the years, a four-year gap in the rigor and complexity of the material students have to work on between grade 12 and the first year in college. The Common Core deals with the fact that far too many American students are unprepared for the 21st century realities of our economy. It is fast moving, it's demanding, and requires workers to gain new skills and knowledge throughout their lives. But let's look at what the Common Core means for all kids in our schools. Closing that four year gap requires kids to read more complex texts at every level and to do more with what they read right from the beginning. Texts of all types, including literary, informational, and expository material with closer reading and greater levels of understanding is required, and kids are going to have to learn from those texts. Now that's hardly a trivial change in what kids will be expected to do in school. They're in addition to the reading, writing, speaking, and listening that Judy mentioned, there's also going to be required a higher level of reasoning, of argumentation, a very different kind of writing than we have been asking kids to do in the past uh, will be required and considerably stronger language skills which are required for college and for the workplace. And what that means for English learners is huge and I don't, you know, I can understand why everyone is worried. If there has got to be a four year gap to be closed for all students you can double or even triple that four-year gap in text demand that con confronts students in general as they enter college, and you will have a sense of what English learners face if they plan to go to college. That's what my, the young man I was working with is facing. The gap they face at present is monumental, which accounts for why so many kids just plain give up in high school. So a huge change is required. Kids are going to have to learn the kind of English needed for literacy and learning faster and more successfully than they do at present. In fact, kids are going to have to really come to a point where they know enough English to deal with literacy. In two or three years, four years to the max, and I'm, I can hear your gasping already, I can hear it. What do you mean two to three years, four years to the max? Well, the question is, and I will get to that in just a little bit, what do English learners and other language minority students, because I, you know, there are a lot of kids who enter school speaking English already who need the same kinds of help you know, as English learners. They need opportunities and support for developing the kind of English required for literacy and learning and academic progress. They need instructional support that takes students from where they are to where they need to be in speaking, listening, reading, writing, reasoning, and thinking as required to be college and career ready. They need confidence in themselves as capable learners, which means that teachers and others regard them as capable learners and teach them accordingly. Is that even possible? Well, actually, yes. It all depends on removing the obstacles that are put before kids. There are a lot of myths, for example, and research misinformation afloat about second language learning. For example, it takes five to seven years or maybe seven to ten years to learn the kind of language required for learning school subjects. Now that's 
what happens when there is no consistency of attention or access to the language provided in school. That five to seven years estimate was based on research that Jim Cummins and I did, were doing back in the 1970s, all right? That was a documentation of what it was taking kids under those, the conditions that existed then. And then later on, seven to 10 years was the estimate of how long it would take kids to learn English under the conditions that were present in the 1980s and 1990s. So um, I think that, that when, uh, that's what happens when learners get everything but what they need for language learning in school. Now, there are huge obstacles to language learning at present. Now, it may or may not be grammatically correct, but English learners can learn complex, challenging materials well before they have learned all of the intricacies of the grammar of English, as Professor Guadalupe Valdez from Stanford reminds us. In fact, what it takes for English learners to achieve full mastery of uh, academic language is work with precisely the rigorous kinds of complex texts that the Common Core requires, which is why I am so happy that we have the Common Core now to give us some guidance. There are two kinds of obstacles that I see. The first is structural and the second is instructional, mostly provided in the guise of instructional help and support for English learners. But first, I want to go over just quickly what it is exactly that English learners need to learn English quickly and successfully, say in two to three or four years max. In a nutshell, they must have access to linguistic data that are true to the target language, true to the target language, and which reveal how the language works in communication in, inter, and interaction with that data at a cognitive level so, and support from more competent others who know the language and data well enough to provide access to the forms, meanings, and communicative intentions encoded in those uh, data. Now, let's think about the kind of language required for literacy and learning, which is sometimes described as academic English, although it is by no means just one unified type that could be easily characterized, packaged up, and taught. It is sufficiently different from ordinary spoken language, which is what kids mostly have access to. Grammatically, lexically, and in how information is packaged up and conveyed, that it is virtually non-interpretable to anyone who knows only the spoken variety of English. It's found mostly in complex written texts. It is learned through literacy and only by interacting with it. Let me go over that again. The language of academic discourse, which is crucial to academic um, progress through grade three, is learned by all children through literacy. There are no native speakers. There are no native speakers of academic language. It involves so-called academic vocabulary, but that's just a tiny part of what makes it different from the language of spoken discourse and is encountered by children principally in complex written texts. As I have noted, it is acquired through meaningful interaction with materials written in such language. But there are obstacles. Let me go over the structural ones first. Call it segregation or isolation by English proficiency, but grouping Eng students by English language proficiency has the same effect 
where language learning is concerned. Okay, just think about the classes where you have wall-to-wall -wall English learners, and there is hardly a proficient speaker of English among them. In fact, the only proficient speaker of English is the teacher. Okay, so learners have minimal contact with competent speakers of English. Now. English learners interacting mostly with other English learners, basing the learning of spoken language forms on the speech produced by other English learners results in the problem of what I have called junky data. The kids need to have, they need to have some idea of how the language is really spoken by proficient speakers of the language. That's why I say that input which is true to the target language is essential. Okay, but isolation of English learners by proficiency level entirely or for longish periods each day, say four hours a day or even all day and so forth with instruction tailored to English proficiency, to their English proficiency, does not provide enough contact or interaction with the kind of language kids need in order to learn the language fully, even the spoken variety. Now, all of that, however, leads to some interesting instructional obstacles. The belief that English is learned and must therefore be taught one word, one feature, one structure at a time it underlies much of this. And then you add all of the structural obstacles, the isolation of kids, English learners with English learners all day long, um, with, uh, and hearing one proficient speaker of English at school, uh, but speaking to people who are just as limited as the learner uh, himself or herself is a real issue, okay? But all of that leads to instruction in which English is the content. English is the content. And the emphasis is on teaching grammar rules and forms in the absence of other subject matter. Now, there are a whole lot of well-intentioned instruction using materials designed to remediate putative shortcomings in students, and that is by English and reading skills, which provide no clue as to how the language they need for literacy actually works. An assumption is that no way can English learners handle complex, grade level, appropriate materials or texts. Consider, for example, the use of greatly simplified texts for English learners and struggling readers. And a whole lot of those struggling readers are actually language minority students who speak nothing but English, all right? What is the emphasis of such materials? Is it skills mostly or content, right? How much progress have English learners and language minority students made in reading since top priority has been given to skill development in the reading programs and remedies of the past 12 years? Poorly developed reading and writing skills are a problem, but can skills be developed in the absence of meaningful content? So I want to show you an example of such texts. And I will give you a reading of this. Dad had a bad van. Dad had a sad lad. The sad lad had to nap. The bad gas had van. Ga the bad van had gas. It actually doesn't make all that much difference, whichever way you put it. Dad had to put the bad, pat the bad van. Mad Dad had to wrap the bad van. Mad Dad had to jab the bad van. Mad Dad had to bam the bad van. Now, the text you just uh, saw and heard was used in a high school English language development class for long-term English learners who were said to be struggling readers. It was sent to me by a teacher who was really 
concern about whether that was uh, appropriate. The question I want to raise is this. If English learners were learning English or to read from such materials, how long would it take them to get within striking distance of grade level common core text? For example, you look at the text that I have on the screen now on the right hand side, you will see one of the exemplar informational texts for grades 6 to 8 in the common core materials. Right? Um, just a second here. Why are texts like this so complex? Well, texts like this historical biographical narrative are complex because they must include enough information to make the content interpretable to potential readers. Any text that conveys serious content can't avoid complexity. I'm just going to go over the, this, this little text because I think it's worth the time. Take a look at the first uh, sentence there. And we see, on March 30th, 1853, that's a little phrase that sets the time frame for this event that's being described in this little uh, excerpt. The handsome, soberly dressed Reverend Theodorus Van Gogh, and this tells who the actor is in this little event, entered this ancient town hall of Groot Zundert. And this tells us what he was doing. Uh, where all of this was taking place in the Brabant, which, t in case you don't know where that is, it, it locates it for you, a province of the, no uh, the Netherlands. He opened the birth register and tells what he did to number 29, where, and now we get some background information, exactly one year earlier. He had written, sadly written, Vincent Bellam Van Gogh, stillborn. All right. Now, I just want to point all this out to you because this kind of language is different. It is uh, grammatically different. It's different in the kind of information packaged up. It's different in terms of how much information um, is uh, being conveyed, included in this little excerpt. Academic texts are, are informationally dense. Many, many pieces of information are crammed into every sentence of text like this one. We find here instances of constructions, expressions, and structural devices which are crucial to academic discourse that are only found in written text. You don't have people speaking uh, in conversations like, on March 30th, 1853, the handsome, soberly dressed Reverend Theodorus Van Gogh entered the ancient town hall of Groot Zundert in the Brabant, a province of the Netherlands, blah, 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 blah. Right? But so the question is this, if you avoid text like this, how are English learners and other students who are unfamiliar with such language to read a text that is so demanding? They cannot do this, of course, without instructional support. One cannot simply hand a complex text to English learners and struggling readers and tell them to read it. That leads only to frustration and failure. Students need help from teachers who are prepared to help them discover how meaning is conveyed in the text, to unpack the information stuffed into the words, phrases, and clauses, and sentences used, and to notice how meaning relates to structures. An approach to doing this has evolved from work that I have been doing in New York City in collaboration with Marianne Cucciara and educators in many K-12 schools in the city. The focus in this work is content. 
curricular content designed to meet grade level standards was our starting point and not English or skill development that was unrelated to that content. The packaging of the content into instructional units that were designed to give learners multiple opportunities to engage with the content through hands and minds on learning activities was the focus of this, this uh, work that we were doing. We advised the use of compelling and complex texts at least as complex as those recommended by the Common Core. And this, by the way, was way we started the work over six years ago now. So this was before the Common Core. The question is why? Well, it's because complex texts are more interesting and more likely to promote learning than simplified ones can. You see, English learners need they require complex texts. Such materials are almost always too demanding for students to work on by themselves. But if they are appropriately complex, they are not too demanding to be worked on with instructional support. One strategy is by giving um, multiple opportunities to work on texts on a given topic to give students thick, thick rather than thin coverage of the content. Each text provides a context and familiarity with the concepts and materials that help support understanding of the ones that follow. This works much better than the once over lightly readings of many, many unrelated topics. Instructional conversations are a key to our approach. These conversations are anchored in instructional units in which students learn content through various activities, including reading uh, informational texts and writing. Each day, teachers select a sentence or two from the text the students are reading to feature in an instructional conversation they conduct with students. And these last from 15 to 20 minutes um, each, all right? Language is the primary focus of the conversations, which begin with a read aloud of the focal sentences. The teachers focus attention on the parts of the sentence, asking questions to invite students to figure out the meaning conveyed by each part. Thus, kids discover how meaning maps onto structures. And this works well. But it takes effort. The approach works where it has been adopted, but there is nothing magical about it. It takes a big effort, and teachers cannot do it without professional development and administrative support. It's going strong in various districts in New York City, Boston, and Franklin Township in New York. New Jersey under Marianne Cucciara's guidance and under hers and mine and the help of the Council of Great City Schools um, uh, in other places where it's taking off in Sacramento, Albuquerque, and very soon in Fresno too. I have also worked with school this, the school district in Beaverton, Oregon as well, uh, where it has been adopted for use in the uh, for English learner programs. The Council of Great City Schools is helping to create an archive of materials to assist school districts in doing this work. Gabriela Uro is the contact there. And you'll see her uh, email address on the screen. So back to the new community college student. After we finish going over a very long and complex article on climate change, he said to me, this is really, really interesting stuff. It's so interesting. He said, but why did they teach me things like this in high school? I didn't need all those English resource classes where I learned nothing. I needed this. I needed this. He will need even more. He'll need reading stamina to read piles upon piles of assigned text. 
He's going to need strategies. I will keep working with him on those for making sense of what he reads. He's going to need to learn study habits to build knowledge from reading. Um, he's going to also need to improve his writing skills, uh, building his skills in reason, discourse, and argumentation. And oh my, I too wish they had taught him all the things he needed in high school. So I thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon. And Thank you for joining our session. I want to start out by thanking Judy and Lily for setting up such a nice context uh, for this third section. I'd like to focus on the Common Core and Effective Instruction for ELF, but looking at it from a whole school perspective, a whole school approach where everyone is involved. Uh, the main points I like to cover is uh, why why do we need a new way of educating else? But I think uh, Judy and Lily did that very nicely already. Um, but I want to go over some of the main points of how core teachers and administrators in a whole school approach to learning are integrating language, literacy, and content in order to address the common core. I will also uh, end with how a whole school professional development program has turned around many schools and most importantly enabled students to succeed. So how do we address the diversity of ELS? Well, first of all, uh, all teachers in the school need to be aware of the diversity of ELS. Uh, they don't come in one flavor. They definitely need the support from ESL, ELD teachers. And they need to recognize that they do have different learning needs. However, all of these students will be in a mainstream common core uh, general education classroom. And so the teachers need to be aware that newcomers size students with interrupted formal education, special education students are going to need some really basic vocabulary in the content areas. They need basic reading and writing instruction and how to do schooling in this country. How do you study for all of these different pieces and how do you accelerate the learning? We also need to show what are the differences for long-term ELS, reclassified ELS, migrant, or even other low-performing students uh, who need more academic language, of course, vocabulary, discourse. But they can focus and zoom in on reading comprehension strategies, uh, do more close deliberate rereading, more text related writing skills, and continue to do more learning how to learn strategies. Um, so we have in the schools a lot of highly schooled newcomers, don't we? They come and they're ready to learn a lot of vocabulary, how to use cognates to their benefits, but they need some grammatical frames. They need more contrasting grammatical features, uh, small doses of phonics, phonemic awareness, but not your typical phonics program uh, or fluency types programs. They're ready for analyzing text features, text structures, and they need to see a lot of models of writing the way writing is conducted in the U.S. Because as we know, writing is done very differently in different countries. Um, also, there are places such as New York City and many others where there seems to be this other cohort of students, the Mexican students, who are the lowest performing of all Latino Hispanic students. So New York is wondering what, what's happening here. 
And we plan to begin uh, to study this a little bit further. Um, yeah, by the way, I am retired, but we're going to start several studies, not only here but elsewhere, to begin to look at this a little bit closer. Um, excuse me. Oops. We OK. OK, we have a little technical difficulty here. Uh -huh. OK, so we'll just have to do this. That way, everybody gets to see it again. <laughs> um, okay, and so we were talking about the studies. Um, what I'm going to discuss today uh, is based on several studies and professional development projects. Uh, it comes from a four-year study in New York City schools, uh, secondary schools, that was funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. And it entailed working with core content teachers, as well as CSL, uh, SEI, sheltered instruction teachers, SIFE teachers, and bilingual teachers. It's also based on a two-year study of SIFE students in 17 schools. And um, a new study, new things that we're trying out in Charlotte, North Carolina, in elementary, middle, and high schools. Uh, but also, in, um, since we're talking about whole school approaches, I also like to mention that there are states now that are doing uh, that will, are getting ready to train all their 28,000, 26,000, thousands of teachers on some of the aspects that I will be mentioning today because it is important for all content teachers as well as ESL teachers to um, get ready for all of this that is coming. Uh, we've also analyzed a lot of our PD and follow-up implementation uh, processes in many schools. So I'll start with that. So what should the PD and the coaching for all teachers in a school look like? If we look at the common core, Um, let's see, somebody needs to mute the sound. I'm sorry, we're having technical difficulties here. Okay, just make sure that you mute the sound. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is what the Common Core says. Uh, yes, we need to teach academic vocabulary, tier one, two, and three words. And the language has to be rich discourse, rich discussions, question formulations, but all of that to help the students get ready for text complexity, reading informational literary, uh, knowing the different text structures as well as developing comprehension skills. And the writing has to come from the text that they are reading. It's no longer, you know, select a topic from the board and uh, write what you did this summer over Christmas. Now, it has to be very text-based type of writing. But perhaps the most important message from the Common Core is that we need to build knowledge in the disciplines. We need to do this by teaching reading, vocabulary, and writing in science, social studies, math, not just in the language arts. The Common Core also says that some students will definitely have smaller tier one, two, and three vocabularies when they enter the classroom. However, instruction must address this vocabulary gap early and aggressively. I love that quote because it is important to address this early and aggressively. And it says to provide more instruction for students with weaker vocabularies 
instead of watering down the materials or offering them fewer words. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Scythe and the other students later. Uh, and it's also important to focus on Tier 2 vocabulary instruction to help the students access grade level text. So let me talk a little bit about these tiers. These tiers are different from Judy's tiers, or rather the tiers that Judy mentioned. These are vocabulary tiers. And let's look at Tier 3. Let's begin with that one because that's the one that core content teachers teach. And they love to teach this. Tier 3 are subject specific words or clusters of words that label the concepts, the subjects, the topics. And of course, these are known also as academic words. Words like osmosis, uh, fractional numbers, ebb, ebb tides, etc. But uh, let's look at Tier 2. These are the most difficult for L's. These are information processing words and phrases that nest the Tier 3 words in long sentences, in short sentences, in questions. Uh, these are the ones that really make a difference for L's. Um, the polysemous words such as power, if we think of power, what it means in math, if we think of power in science, and how would they hear the word power in social studies or government? All these polysemous words are critically important to, uh, to, to teach within the context of the content that the teachers are imparting. Um, think of the word trunk. That's an easy one. A car trunk, a t tree trunk, body trunk. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, all kinds of trunks. So, so some of these are simpler, and these can be taught very quickly. However, there are many polysemous words in the content areas that make it very difficult for students to transition from one subject to another and not having a clear definition of what that is. Um, and of course, there are transition words, connectors, that help the students develop cohesive pieces of writing. Uh, the therefores, the moreovers, over the course of, these are things that need to be um, taken into consideration and taught explicitly before the students begin their writing. More sophisticated words is another subcategory for Tier 2. Uh, sophisticated words for rich discussions, for specificity in their oral descriptions, in their writings, words like such, such as declare, precise, ire, instead of the simple words that the students are always using. I've been looking at tests in different states. And these are some of the Tier 2 words that I found in the first couple of pages of these tests. Uh, these are Tier 2. And these words cut across all the content areas and all those terrible, horrible, no good, very bad tests that our poor darlings have to take. Um, but words alone is not going to cut it. Students, teachers need to focus on oracy, the ability to express oneself fluently and grammatically in speech. It's not just words for words' sake. It's not just teaching vocabulary in isolation. Can the students construct formal discourse, uh, put together a formal discussion, put together a speech, a summary, engage in conversation with those words? Also, Vocabulary is definitely prevalent in complex text. And so we need to develop a sense of excitement about these words uh, through wordplay, yes, definitely. But most importantly, through rich discussions, uh, such as those that Lily was mentioning, through oral and written summaries. After a student has read a paragraph, it's important for that student to summarize what he or she has just read 
using the Tier 2 and Tier 3 words, using the grammatical structures. And then, after reading uh, small chunks of text, it's important to stop and give the students time for rich, rigorous conversations that are dependent on a common text. This is found to be difficult in some cases because some reading programs send students to select their own text, and you have 20 students in a class reading different text. So there's never opportunities for that rich, rigorous conversation. Questions and tasks are something else that the Common Core advises. It is important to provide high quality quality sequences of text-dependent questions for students to use as models so that they themselves can formulate these questions. And the questions are also used to help the students pay more attention to specific words, to details, to arguments in the text, and to explore uh, more specific topics on the same text and to demonstrate that they really understood the details of what is explicitly stated in that text. So you're probably thinking, yeah, we don't have enough time. It's important to have enough time because the Common Core says reading well means gaining maximum insight or knowledge possible the knowledge that is possible from each source. Therefore, they say, use shorter challenging texts that elicit close reading and rereading at each grade level. And they don't mean that if you read something yesterday, you're going to reread it again today just for the sake of rereading. Now, it has to be a different type of reading and always looking for different aspects of um, complexity and, um, and different passages for providing those opportunities. The other important thing that they mention is that students should reread deliberately and slowly to probe and ponder, for them to pick up the strategies and to develop the knowledge for learning meanings of individual words on their own, to look at the order of sentences which unfold, to begin to think about the development of ideas over the course of a text, but to do this on their own, and most importantly, to, be, to get used to summarizing the content that they're reading using the new vocabulary and the new syntax structures. When it comes to writing, the Common Core says writing is to show that students can analyze, synthesize sources that they have just read. It's presenting careful analyses, it's well-defended claims, ideas, and clear information that they have to do for, a, for that particular type of writing. They need to draw evidence from a text in order to support all this analysis, the reflection, and to continue to conduct more research. So all of this comes back to slow, deliberate writing processes. And as some teachers uh, in our schools have found, the ultimate proof, the way of knowing if a student has learned the vocabulary, the syntax, the content, is to ask their students at the end of the period or the block or the day uh, this question, can my L's write one or two paragraphs summarizing what they learned about X, Y, and Z? using as many Tier 2 and Tier 3 words uh, as they have learned. Can they write this paragraph from memory without prompts, without open books, without posters on the walls? And um, 
and and then they assign extra points if they're using appropriate connectors, transition words, signal words. When students have to do this every day uh, after every subject, they get used to the fact that they're being held accountable for learning and using all the vocabulary that the teacher is teaching. Uh, but it takes a lot of redundancy, and it's not just teaching vocabulary. It's really applying the vocabulary into reading. Uh, in the program we call Excel, Expediting Reading Comprehension for English Language Learners, uh, we have 12 building blocks that teachers go through in order to provide all that close reading and the writing. So it all has to come together. It's not just one or the other. It's not just reading. It's not just writing or vocabulary in isolation. It has to be connected in order for all students to be able to, to um, uh, do well and develop that depth of learning. Um, so the professional development has to take all of these aspects into consideration. The professional development in a whole school includes the teachers, the coaches, the administrators, everyone in learning how to integrate academic language, reading comprehension, and writing skills in all their content subjects. Uh, and this is from K through 12. The whole school professional development um, also sets out to provide the ESL and the ELD teachers, BD, on how to develop that rigorous academic language instruction for accelerating the listening, speaking, reading, and writing development. This is critically important when ELD teachers and content teachers team up to help the, the SIFE students, the newcomers, those students that need additional assistance. But in order for that to take place, it is important for schools, the administration, to provide scheduled quality time for teachers to meet, to plan, and co-teach. These are some of the structures that need to be revised in order for professional development to work. It is important to provide also um, a lot of uh, different types of PD for bilingual credential teachers. They come to us and they ask us to help them figure out how to do all of this in dual language programs, which is a little bit different as well, but it's the same principles and the same approaches. How do we evaluate professional development? The way to evaluate professional development is to ask the question, is there transfer from my PD program? And also, is there a comprehensive training for all the teachers with follow-up systematic coaching and continuous learning in PLCs, professional learning communities, or TLCs, teachers learning communities, in the school? And do they focus on ELF? And is professional learning around ELF um, a quality type? Or sometimes, as it happens sometimes, the PD gets reduced to a few teachers attending a workshop, maybe a three-day institute, and then coming back and um, having to turnkey this type of training in one or two hour sessions at the school. That is not a whole school staff development. It has to uh, be more systematic and more comprehensive. Um, we um, see also, as we evaluate our programs, that the type of training program and follow-up has different types of results. If we look at this horizontally, we see that without sufficient teacher support systems, established by the district and the school, there will be hardly any impact on students. 
On the other hand, when there are 15 to 20 PD days a year, plus weekly TLCs, weekly coaching for each teacher, and if we look at this or, uh, vertically, we see that at the end of the year there is definite impact on students. That's what we're looking for in PD, not just a wonderful uh, five-day institute and that's it, folks, but what is the transfer? There are uh, indicators now to measure the impact. For instance, we can look at the training program and if the program offers workshops on vocabulary, reading, writing for ELF, uh, plus several other things. Uh, how does that transfer into every teacher's teaching repertoire? Can the teachers cite the sources, the research, evidence-based research, not the myths that we've learned in the past, but real research? And can the teacher use five to ten strategies to teach vocabulary, reading, writing, etc., that um, I mentioned? And does the teacher invite other teachers to observe or invites others to videotape? That means that they have developed a certain level of confidence and they are uh, definitely gaining a lot from the PD, but most importantly that there are support systems in the school. If we want this level of transfer for, for teachers, then we need to give them all the support in order to get to this point. But we need to look at student impact as well. Uh, does the teacher's teaching work for students? Is the teaching reaching all the students? Do the students master five to ten words daily? Do they use the new words in their daily speech, in their summaries, in their reading? Do we see increased reading fluency, comprehension, writing? And uh, how many of these words appear in the writing? And of course, how are the end of the year outcomes uh, that, uh, that we can measure and we can gauge by working backwards and seeing, well, did that training really have an impact and is this helping all our students now reach high levels of success, academic success, and also all the things that we, we want and we wish for uh, for their future. Thank you very much and I think we're going to stop now for questions and answers. Um, this is Joanne. Um, I don't know exactly how we're going to go about answering all your very good questions that have been popping up. Um, um, Kira, I don't know if you want to prioritize any of the questions. Absolutely, Joanne. I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, I have some questions from earlier in the session and I also have some questions. Um, if, if folks still have questions, please do um, continue to put those into the chat box here. We've had a really great discussion. Um, I don't know if our presenters have had a chance to notice this, but our, our participants have been having some really good back and forth here um, in our chat window. Um, I do have some questions that I've pulled out of that um, and I just did want to mention because several people have asked throughout the session that the PowerPoint presentation will be available and also the entire recording of the webinar with the audio will be available on Insella's website after after the event and we'll send out a note to the Incella list, our mailing list, um, when those materials are ready. Uh, okay, so I wanted to start first with a couple of questions that came um, back from, from right at the beginning of our presentation when Judy was talking. Um, Judy, you, you spoke about making database decisions to drive instructions and one of uh, the questions, this is from Julie Engeland, she says, 
I would love to make database decisions, but I don't have appropriate measures for my ELLs. One test a year is not enough. I wonder if you could speak to perhaps how classroom teachers might be able to go about making database decisions if they only have a limited number of assessments throughout the year to rely on. That's a great question. Um, I Typically, um, it's not only for our English learners, but the folks that teach at a, a secondary level also have um, some similar challenges. And so what folks have really worked to do is to take, you know, starting with the standards in mind, beginning with the end in mind in terms of what do we expect all students to know and be able to do, and assess how they're doing. So in many places, common assessments have been developed through the work of teachers getting together and creating formative assessments that would allow um, teachers to assess whether and how well students, um, English learner students, are progressing in the curriculum. So if, in fact, there's not a published formative assessment, um, folks have addressed those needs by actually you know, taking folks who know how students learn and which are teachers of English learners and creating their own formative assessments um, to address those issues. Thank you. The next question that I have is um, about the speaking and listening components of the ELA Common Core Standards. Um, and I think there might be maybe some people would like some clarification on exactly how those re, um, inter, interrelate to speaking and listening standards with regard to English language proficiency. Um, so I wonder if you, if you or perhaps one of the other uh, presenters might want to um, answer that question. Oh, this is Lily. Um, let, let me just, uh, yes, I have a hard time talking um, briefly, as many of you know. So, but uh, you know, one of the really great things about the Common Core is its emphasis on read-alouds and uh, on, um, you know, in, in throughout the, uh, the English language arts curriculum. Now, I, th this is one of the most important ways that teachers can support. Uh, the um, uh, English learners in coming to hear how English sounds, uh, coming to uh, grips with the the uh, the structuring in sentences and so forth. But only when um, texts are read well, which is to say, with, where teachers have done some practicing and know um, how to pause at times and, and using intonational contours to mark off units and so on. Now, uh, teaching children to listen closely and to respond uh, to uh, conversations within the classroom. Uh, this is something that really needs to be developed, built on, and so on. And here I would like to call your attention to some work uh, that Kathy O'Connor at uh, Boston University and Sarah Michaels at Clark University um, in Massachusetts have been developing uh, for Turk. Now there is a whole series of materials called uh, training materials called uh, talk moves that can be accessed on the Turk um, uh, website. This is T E R C, um, and if you Google talk moves plus Turk T E R C, you will get um, uh, access to some of those materials. Wonderful. Um, I, and this is a, another question um, about uh, teaching strategies. Um, and this is a more recent one that our commenter just uh, posted. Thank you for making the very, the very important point about the time needed to carry out effective teaching. Can you help with strategies to convince administrators that teachers need time to teach language and not the amount of prescribed time which is typical? Uh, this is Margarita. I guess I'll, I'll start with 
with that. Uh, yes, it is critically important for administrators to understand this. Uh, that's why we started doing training sessions for administrators in addition to doing training sessions for, for teachers and coaches, which has been uh, the norm in the past. Now, we do not work with a school or a school district or a state if it doesn't mean that the principals and central administrators are going to be part of this. Uh, when that happens, then uh, it, they easily understand what the teachers are having to go through. So it is important to include administrators uh, wherever possible, whenever there is a PD program being offered, uh, inviting them or having separate sessions. Uh, we are about to do that in Charlotte as principals attend some of the sessions. I will pull out the principals in the afternoon and we're going to do our own session. Uh, that's just one way of doing it. In uh, Connecticut, we do basically the same thing. The principals are always there working with the teachers, sitting down with the teachers, and understanding what the teachers are going through. Uh, can I add something here? Uh, this is Lily. In fact, I would argue that it is absolutely crucial that administration, uh, administrators uh, from top, to, uh, top level district uh, administrators to school level administrators be included in professional development. The reason being that this is work. You know, the work that is required to make the Common Core work for everyone cannot be done by teachers without the necessary support, without the time made for planning and, and uh, developing uh, strategies and materials, for learning enough about what needs to be done uh, to, to be doing the work. Um, it's, and someone also has to cut teachers some slack. Now, I, I know that there's, it's very important that we be, well, we, we take a look at, at how uh, teachers are doing and, and are sure that teachers are doing what ch as the children need. But at the same time, someone has to cut them some slack during the time they are learning to do all these big and new and complicated um, Kinds of instructional uh, strategies, uh, and I would I could I could add to that as part of the, the multi-tier system of support. Um, you know, the work is really around leadership, and um, it is absolutely essential at the at the building level that there is a school-based leadership team, which includes the principal, to have those robust conversations around professional development and how do you ensure that there is fidelity of implementation you know, from the principal understanding all the way down to the teachers implementing, um, you know, and really letting everybody off the hook that, you know, I personally don't believe in the expert model. I don't think you can go to one professional development and expect to be able to go back in and have it perfect the, the next day that you're doing it. So this is really about collaboration and support throughout this. At the same token, with um, a district-wide uh, approach to the multi-tiered system, that it's, inc it's incredibly important that you have a district-based leadership team for all the reasons that were just discussed to ensure that at the right hand and the left hand know what's going on. Are we actually helping our teachers um, help our students learn those standards. So leadership is a huge aspect of it. Um, and I saw one of the comments from one of the, the folks saying, well, our administrators are always welcome to come, but they don't always come. So that's really an issue of having a courageous conversation around accountability and ensuring that everybody who needs to be at the table are, are at the table to ensure that we support our teachers to deliver the best instruction for students. Um, this is Joanne, and I would like to point out to one of the slides on principle three, which uh, it is supporting effective instruction and leadership. So the department is very interested in including your administrative leadership in uh, making sure that they are making a difference in the performance of all students. And um, so there's a, a big uh, push to make sure that you also have effective 
uh, instructional leaders in, in, in each building. So definitely um, it, it is the responsibility not only of the language development teachers, but it is the responsibility of all teachers and in particular of the uh, leadership in, the, in each building. I'm going to come in now with another question, and I think this one was, um, this is sort of a, a, um, a distillation of a number of comments that came through, and this is in response to Lily's remarks on making sure that EL students spend adequate time with proficient English speakers. So, um, of course, as we all know, there's a lot of diverse instructional contexts context across the nation where uh, English, there may be schools with large numbers of EL students where there are not a whole lot of uh, professional English students, there may be different kinds of instructional models. I wonder if you could speak, uh, Lily and perhaps others, about how different ways in which practitioners can make sure that their students get that good data, not that junky data, given that we have a really diverse set of instructional settings and contexts for EL students around the nation. Uh, uh, that, that is really a tough question. But interestingly, I have seen situations where there, is, there are very few English learners, uh, um, uh, native speakers of English, um, in a school, in a classroom, and still you get great results. And you get great results when the instructional setting is set up in such a way that much of the conversations are managed, um, and you know the, the the fewer English speakers you have, the more the um, the discourse uh, situation in the classroom has got to be um, uh, formalized and also structured to maximize the interaction between teachers and students. Uh, when that happens, you know, it doesn't look very pretty. You know, you're not going to get a whole lot of of student to student uh, talking initially. You get more of that later on. Uh, but uh, when the, when a teacher is managing and providing uh, adequate, lovingly given, you know, uh, extremely gentle, uh, corrective feedback you can have a similar result, although it may just take a little bit longer for students to learn to, to speak the language without, any, without evidence of the uh, first language showing through. Uh, by the way, I want to say something about the first language, too. Uh, I noticed as I, you know, when people were typing uh, comments, uh, I saw someone comment, Where, what about the first language? Yeah, what about it? You know, I am deeply concerned about that. Uh, I believe that. Uh, if well, uh, if students only learn English, and uh, and that is at the expense of their mother tongues, we have not done the students, their families, or our society uh, a favor. Uh, I believe in encouraging the retention of the mother tongue. I believe in strengthening it, and in places where you know, happily the, the state still permits. Uh, easy uh, access to bilingual education. Listen, you got to be doing the same thing in the mother tongue of the kids in bilingual programs as you are doing for English in the teaching of uh, the academic register um, of students and using complex texts, complex materials, rigor, and so forth. But yeah, it, it's. I wish I, I could. Um, I could. Uh, I had enough time to explain what I mean by all of this. Only know that it is possible, but you just can't have a whole lot of, of time spent in group work or in in uh, discourse free for all, uh, where there are very few native speakers of the language to go around. 
And I just like to to add that I'm excited that at least these three states will now be uh, requiring all their core content teachers to go through extensive professional development uh, for teaching academic language, reading comprehension, and writing to ELLs that are in their classrooms. As more states buy into this, and school districts, even school districts are doing this, as well as the schools. Uh, a single school can do the same thing. As long as every teacher is involved, that accelerates the learning of uh, oracy as well as uh, literacy. And so we just need to uh, try to get as many educators involved in this as possible. And as Joanne says, well, they've got to do it anyway. So we might as well start as as soon as possible. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Um, Margarita, you raised at the beginning of your piece of the presentation, you spoke a lot about diversity among EL students. And we had a little bit of a discussion here in the, in the chat about some of the challenges of identifying uh, gifted and talented learners when those are also English learners. I wonder if any of you would like to perhaps speak about some challenges or maybe some solutions that you know of um, to um, identify gifted and talented English learners. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll start, but I think Judy can also contribute quite a bit of this because um, as, as we think of um, uh, working with whole schools, uh, RTI comes into play. And if when all of that is in place, then the special education, uh, size, gifted students are identified early on. And you know, there are, as I mentioned, there are many newcomers who are highly schooled, and many of those are, are gifted. And yet we put them in the same ESL class with all the other students. Um, that's very unfair. And as the schools begin to look at this from a holistic perspective, that's when uh, the diversity of students will be served adequately, appropriately, and um, magnificently. I would like to add to um, this conversation. Um, you know, when No Child Left Behind uh, was uh, implemented, and we now are 10, 11, 12 years, I've lost track, um, you know, ELs have been a, very, a, a group that it's looked at very like they're all the same. And I think um, it is important that we um, have a conversation in each of our schools and in each of our uh, districts uh, around the topic of the heterogeneity of uh, the EL subgroup. And um, when Judy was talking about the um, uh, core instruction and the use of data to uh, differentiate instruction, you, if, this, if you have the data to be able to do this, not everybody does, but if you do, then you start seeing that um, the EL subgroup is, is very different and meeting their needs will be different uh, from your uh, students with interrupted instructions is, uh, in one um, outlier to the gifted um, and very uh, well educated when they come in. So I think that's the first step is to make sure that everybody in the building and in the district starts realizing that not all ELs are created equal and that therefore your approach, your programs, your uh, policies must uh, address that uh, difference. Great, and I, I would just underscore that. And I think, um, you know, being a former school psychologist, I think what 
I would encourage us all to do is to, you know, the MTSS and RTI is not about putting kids in special education. It's really about, um, to your point, Joanne, really identifying kids early on in terms of instructional needs. And the question about, you know, what do we do to create assessments? Because there's such nuances among and between our SIFE students and our EL students, you're not going to find an assessment that you're going to be able to take off the shelf and, and give to all of our kiddos because of what you just said. So, you know, I would encourage us to start with looking at the number of students that are in special education right now that are English learners. Um, and how have they been assessed in their native language as well as in English before they were, you know, assessed to being, um, you know, a, typically they're they're seen as, you know, learn, learning disabled students when in fact um, it's a, a language proficiency issue, not an issue of a learning disability. So it really, um, the MTSS model really is, it's the hardest work we'll do and it's messy, but it is the good work around ensuring that students get what they need and that we, because we don't have enough resources at our fingertips, we put them in special ed. And we know that less than 5% of the students that are ever put into special ed ever exit it. So it's really behooving us to have those courageous conversations to say, have we aligned our resources in such a way that we have the assessments and the screens and we have the methodology and the professional development in order to support our teachers and administrators to ensure that our English learners are getting the equitable access to the instruction that they need. Okay, I think we're running out of time, so um, I would like to close, first of all, by thanking these three wonderful ladies for um, sharing their um, insights and their great experience and knowledge in this area. Um, and I would like to um, conclude by pointing out some of the things that they said. And um, I will start by saying uh, from Lily's uh, presentation that the Common Core State Standards um, are a great opportunity um, because it, will, it has focused instruction towards death versus you know teaching a lot of things, just teach less but with greater depth. And that alone is helpful with ELs. Um, but also because um, the issue of that we have been talking about is not only for ELs. Uh, there will be uh, a lot of um, struggles with all uh, students. So the conversations will um, benefit um, the uh, EL population. Um, and I also want to add to the fact that um, we need to make sure that ELs receive quality core instruction that is on grade level. And uh, I don't think we're anywhere th there in many places around the nation. And the last thing I want to emphasize, which um, the um, waivers, the flexibilities, and the rest of the top program in includes is that it is everybody's responsibility to make sure that all students are able to um, uh, function and, and meet the standards that are, uh, will make them college and career ready. So um, again, I, I thank you all very much. Uh, we had a great participation. And Akira, I don't know if you want to say anything about the um, evaluation. Sure, just I want to just um, alert people to be um, aware that they'll be getting an email in the next couple of hours with an evaluation for the webinar. And so just go ahead and click through, complete the evaluation. We'd really appreciate your feedback. And also, again, to remind everybody that the recording will be available on our website, and also the PowerPoint presentation will be available on Encella's website. And you can see that URL right up on your screen right now.
This closes our presentation today, and I would like to thank our presenters and also all of our participants for their wonderful input in our chat room here. Um, I'm so sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions, um, and I do hope that you carry on these conversations in your districts as you uh, go back and, and pass this information along. Again, thank you to everybody involved today.